As we sing this first song during the musical interludes, uh, there will be scripture on the screen. I just want to encourage you to read the scriptures uh, and let them fuel your worship of Jesus as we worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords tonight. Would you stand as we sing? Oh, hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall, bring forth the
sacred throne we at his feet may fall we'll join the everlasting song and cry and the bride say come and let the one who hears say come and let the one who is thirsty come let the one who desires take the water of life without price he who testifies to these things says surely I'm coming soon amen come Lord Jesus crowned him Lord of all, and now we're going to celebrate what he came to do so that we could know him as Lord and Savior. In the darkness we were waiting, without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophecy. Virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the
You can be seated for just a moment. Good evening. Welcome back to church uh, on the very best day of the week by far. Uh, I am amazed, and I hope you are too, at what we get to do. You get to come together in the morning, and you get to sing songs, and you get to pray prayers, and you get to see wonderful people smiling, and you get to encourage one another and help one another, and get to worship and sing songs and pray together. You get to hear the word preached. There, You get to have lunch after all that. Maybe some of you got to have a nap after all of that. And then, then we get to come back together. Since I became a Christian when I was in high school, there's always been something about Sunday night that has just made me in love with it. I love Sunday night church. I love uh, ending the Lord's day with worship. I love ending the Lord's day with worship here with you to come together and pray and sing again and hear the word preached again. And tonight uh, we get to hear the word be brought to us from Pastor Sean Perrone, our associate pastor. And he is beginning a new sermon series called What Every Pastor Wants You to Know but doesn't want to tell you. Did I get that right? That's what I said too. What every pastor wants you to know, but doesn't want to tell you. I've been in church since high school. I've never heard of such a sermon series. I've been in ministry for my adult life. I've never heard of such a sermon series. So <laughs> you haven't either. That's right. So this is fully original with Sean. So uh, all responsibility for anything good or bad is on him. You get all the praise, you get all the blame. <laughs> I don't know what he's going to say. I have no idea what he's going it's, to uh, It's every Sunday night in July, so we're in for it. I did ask him tonight. I said, okay, so you have to give me a provocative word that will create anticipation for what you are going to say. And he said, Submit. We're off to a somewhat rocky beginning. <laughs> but Sean, we believe that you can get us out of the ditch that we just went into. All right, so that's the word he gave me to, uh, to share with you, and we are looking forward to hearing what he has to say about that and about the word and about Jesus. And I don't know what he's going to say, but I know we'll know more about the Bible, and I know, more, know we'll know more about Jesus and know more of his grace when we're through. So as we prepare to continue in worship and to hear the word be preached here in just a few minutes, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are thankful to be back together again tonight. We are thankful for the body of believers that strengthens and encourages and supports each and every one of us. I pray that that would happen now. I pray that as we sing again even as we're praying, and Father, as your word is opened to us, would you transform our hearts? Would you transform our lives? Would you make us different men and women because we were here together tonight? And Father, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This next song has become a, a really precious song to our church. It is the song, He Will Hold Me Fast. And uh, there's a a lot of lines in this song that I hope you identify with uh, tonight. And what's wonderful about this song is that so many different lines hit us at different places, depending on where we are. Maybe tonight you are here and your love for Christ feels cold, but you believe. You, you know him. It's just you, you feel cold in your love for him. Well, he's holding you fast tonight. Maybe you're not there. Maybe you're going through a trial. He's holding you fast. So we're going to celebrate this truth together tonight, that Jesus is holding us as a church. Would you stand as we sing? i 
neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you so much that we can gather as a church and sing words like you will hold us fast. Thank you that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are mighty and powerful, and yet you draw near to the lowly and bind up their wounds. Thank you, Jesus. I want to pray that you would now open our hearts to receive your word. Lord, I pray that it would be planted there and would bear much fruit. That we would be those who are the good soil that hear your word and it bears fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, good evening. It is a joy to be with you all this evening. I have so much that is uh, swimming around in my heart as I've been looking forward to uh, this series and been praying for you and been thinking about uh, the scripture. And uh, I was telling Jenny on the way in that I actually don't exactly know what is going to come out tonight. Uh, I have so much in there. (laughs) But the good news is we have three weeks uh, to work on it. And I want to frame uh, frame the three weeks uh, and kind of set the expectations. So uh, tonight we're going to talk about uh, how, uh, how pastors uh, preach the word and counsel the word and lead, uh, lead the sheep. And uh, we'll talk about that tonight in particular. And then the following Sunday night, we'll talk about the life and ministry of a pastor that uh, you probably don't see very much. So we're going to do more of a day in the life of, uh, of what you probably don't know uh, about pastoral ministry. And then uh, the last uh, Sunday, we'll look at uh, how a pastor wants you to listen to him speak and what he does and doesn't want you to do, and uh, what he prefers and won't tell you, but uh, would love for you to know. So it's my prayer that through this series, we will look more like Jesus and uh, love him as our great shepherd as we're thinking about uh, this this passage uh, from the book of Hebrews. So go ahead and turn to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 13. This will be the passage that we look at each week that we're in the series. And I, uh, as Heath alluded to, I am going to uh, commit one of the cardinal sins of our culture, and that is uh, I'm going to talk about submission. When, uh, when our culture hears the word submit, we usually think that uh, that's the kind of thing that someone should tell their dog. Or that's uh, what a domineering patriarchal husband says, or a slave owner, or some massive inequality that's taking place. And th- those can be true. Uh, those, uh, those inequalities do exist, and those uh, bad versions of submission are out there, unbiblical. But that's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about uh, biblical submission. And it is my goal that you would come away from Hebrews 13 excited about submission, that you would leave tonight knowing that it is a good thing and that God wants it in your life and that it is a blessing and not a burden. So let's read Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their way of life, imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be misled by varied and strained teachings. For it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, through which those who were so occupied with them were not benefited. We have an altar from which those who serve in the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus 
also suffered outside the gate, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood. So then let us go to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. Through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of lips praising him. And do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account, so that they may do this with joy and not groaning, for that would be unhelpful for you. Let's pray and ask God for his help. Heavenly Father, I am very acutely aware of my weaknesses and my shortcomings, and I am equally amazed and aware of your majesty and your lordship. And I ask that as we look at your word and we seek to apply it to our particular church, to us, help us. Holy Spirit, help us. Make us look more like you so that we can leave here tonight full of submissive hearts to you and your lordship. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're here in the book of Hebrews, and we come to the last chapter, and there are numerous exhortations that happen in chapter 13. I counted 18 when I read uh, the last round through, and I want to focus in on the one that is in particular in verse 17. So look at it again. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account, so that they may do this with joy and not groaning, for this would be unhelpful to you. So it says, obey your leaders. Now, that language of leader, it's used actually three times in chapter 13. If you look back up, look at verse 7. It says, remember those who led you. Remember your leaders, the ESV says. So these leaders are important to the author of Hebrews. And he's saying, remember them, obey them, submit to them. So, What kind of leaders are these? Who are they? Well, they are past leaders and present leaders. So, if you think of verse 7 where it says, remember your leaders. In order to remember them, that means they're, they're not actually there at the moment. And that makes sense in Hebrews because Hebrews chapter 11, you have the hall of faith, right? So, the famous chapter where it lists all of these spiritual leaders. And then you get to chapter 12, and it says, look unto Jesus, the author and finisher, and the author and perfecter of our faith. And so there's this call to look back to your leaders who have lived the godly life before you. But then you get to the present tense. You get to obey your leaders. You can't obey someone in the past. That's, that's real, live humans that are in your midst. Obey your leaders. And they are the people who spoke the word of God to you. Look at verse 7. It describes the leaders as those who spoke the word of God to you. This is a really big deal. Pastors, I think, are included in this category here. I think it's the primary focus. And pastors speak on behalf of God to the people of God. This is a weighty thing, and if I could say at the very beginning what every pastor who's a good pastor wants you to know is that when he's up here preaching, when he's counseling the Scripture to you, he's not doing it to entertain. The pastor is not doing it to make you feel good. The pastor is not doing his job in order so that you can think great thoughts about him. The pastor is speaking God's words so that you might fall before a holy God and submit to his lordship. So a pastor is not speaking on his own authority. 
A pastor has no authority on his own. All authority is given to Jesus Christ in heaven and on earth. And it is of crucial importance that you hear what the pastor is saying because the pastor is not just speaking words that are meaningless or here just just to have a moment where we're all excited about life. The pastor is speaking words so that you can be transformed and look more like Jesus Christ. Why is he doing this? Why is the preacher doing this? The preacher is doing this because he has to give an account to God. Let not many of you become teachers, for in doing so you will receive a stricter judgment. There's all kinds of speeches that are important and good. Politicians give speeches, CEOs give speeches, all kinds of speeches take place. But the most important speech that you can hear is God's word explained to you. This is crucial. It says, look in verse 17. It says, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will give an account. This is, this is a sobering text for a pastor. Do you realize that the pastors here on staff, when they stand before God, will have questions asked of them that you won't have? There are, there's an accountability here that comes with the office of pastor that you don't have to experience if you're not a pastor. And that kind of makes me shudder. I don't know exactly what those questions are, But I do know from verse 17, it says, they are keeping watch over your souls. Your souls. This means the work is soul work. It's eternal work. It's everlasting work. The pastor might hear questions from God about where is is John spiritually? How did you care for Susan? Did you minister to Tim when he was suffering? Did you fear man when you needed to make that decision and you wanted to hear their praise instead of do what was right? Did you call them to repentance or did you soft pedal it? There's an accountability that comes with being a pastor that is sobering and serious. This text also tells us that there is a personal nature to pastoral ministry. Obey and submit to your leaders. This is personal. This is not something that uh, you can get from uh, any of the preachers that you don't know and don't know you that you listen to on the radio. I don't know if people listen to preachers on the radio anymore. Maybe you do podcasts or YouTube or whatever the medium is. There's a reason why every week we don't just video in Billy Graham sermons or John MacArthur sermons. There's a reason why God has designed his church to be led by real, live humans called pastors. And there is a personal connection. There's a personal, personal word that you need to hear. And it's, and here in Hebrews, he's saying, you obey and submit to your leaders. Billy Graham doesn't know you. John MacArthur doesn't know you. John MacArthur doesn't know this church in particular. Billy Graham doesn't know this church in particular. But Pastor Heath does. The pastors here do. They know you. And God doesn't want you to hear words from random or even helpful or wonderful or amazing preachers. He wants you to hear words from the people who love you and know you and are with you. This is crucial And what it means is the pastors here on staff, I love serving with the pastors here on staff. When Heath gets up 
and he's about to cry and tell you how much he loves you. It's real. I know it's real because he does it when I'm with him. So he's not, he's not faking it. It's authentic. And what it means is, it means you have people, shepherds, who care about you, who are being held accountable, duty-bound to God, but not just duty-bound to God, but full of delight to love you, full of delight to care for you. And it is a, there's a personal connection that I don't want you to miss. And so if I'm going to add another thing to what every pastor wants to tell you, let me say this. The pastors here at First Baptist, they want to be involved in your life. I know this. When was the last time you asked a pastor for advice? When was the last time that you put yourself in a position to obey and submit to your pastor? Your pastors want to know you and love you and speak into your life with wisdom and care and love. That's why we're here. The role of a pastor, there's no authority in and of itself from a human. It comes from God, from the Word, to speak particularly to your life, and I want you to take advantage of it. Now, if I'm going to be honest, there's a, there's a requirement here for the pastor to be a good, qualified, godly, biblical pastor who doesn't ask you to submit things just because he wants you to and randomly, but opens up the Bible. So there's a requirement for the pastor. But there's also a requirement for church members. So look back at the text, Hebrews 13, verse 17. Obey your leaders and to submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable to you. All right. So, if uh, you were going to kidnap one of the pastors here, and you, uh, you blindfold them, and uh, you take them into a smoky room, and tie them to a chair, and give them a truth serum, and there's a bare light bulb that's swinging that they can hear the chains rattling, and you say, are there church members that you want to avoid? That pastor would not tell you the truth, (laughs) and they would resist, but if you pressed them, they would have to admit that there are some church members that they see and joy fills their heart, and there's other church members that they see coming, and they're tempted to groan. And I don't want to tell you that, but God says that. So look at it again. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders, submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief. The ESV says groaning, for this would be unprofitable to you. So what's going on here? Let me first tell you what's not going on here. What this means is, this does not mean that the church member that makes the pastor's job easy and full of joy is the quiet, silent church member. That's not what it's talking about. In fact, I know that because uh, when I walk around the halls, I turn a corner and there's several of you that uh, you, you have more opinions than others. Okay? Huh? Just being honest. That's okay. And my heart is full of joy to see you. And I am thrilled. And it is a real delight. And I mean it. And you know who you are. And you know how happy I am to see you. And the reason has nothing to do with your opinions. The reason has to do with your heart. There is a world of difference between someone who has strong opinions and is a grumpy Gus than someone who has strong opinions and has a submissive heart. 
The folks with submissive hearts give our pastors joy. We want to hear from you. We want to know what you're thinking. And it is a joy because your hearts are soft. Your hearts love the word. Your hearts love our Lord. Your hearts love us. And it is a true delight to hear your opinions. I know this from the text here. Look back. So right in the middle of this section between the leaders, he says in verse 9, Do not be carried away by various and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace. The heart is in view here. The heart is strengthened by grace. Pastors care about your heart. We don't care about the externals for the external's sake. We don't care about behavior for behavior's sake. What we care is that your heart is throbbing with love for our Lord, that is throbbing with love for His church, and we can see it and we know it. And when your heart is that way, it's so easy. It is such a joy to serve. But there are moments when a pastor might be tempted because maybe there's a grumpy Gus that's coming by. And uh, let me give you a practical example. So this is a true story. I was with a pastor getting lunch uh, two weeks ago, and uh, I did not ask him to give me sermon material for this. It just came out. And he was uh, describing two church members. So this is a tale of two church members, real <laughs> live church members. The names will be concealed to protect the innocent. <laughs> and he said, do you know, I was talking to this one guy, and he told me about this problem, and he might be right, but, you know, he just complains about everything. So I don't know if he's crying wolf. I don't know if it's a real problem. I, I just don't know because he's always grumpy. I love him. I love him. But I don't know if it's real or not. And he was confused until he said he had another church member take him out to lunch, and he's eating lunch with this church member. And they said, do you know, Pastor, we're so thankful for you. We're so thankful for all the hard work you're doing. We are so thankful to be at First Baptist. And, uh, I, you know, there's been something that's been on my mind. And let me tell you what it is. The church member told him. And they said, you know what? We're not going to hold you hostage over it. We don't care what you do. It's a preference thing. But we really think you should consider it. And he said, I knew in that moment that this was a real live issue. It was the same issue. It was the same thing. But I knew it was real because that person was a reliable source because their heart is invested in what's taking place. Their heart is submissive to what is going on in the Word of God. And they're not always complaining and grumpy. And so I could take them at their word. And it was so helpful. When, when we think about this, what I would like to submit, what every pastor would like for you to know is this. The next time you raise up an issue, you raise a flag, and you should, you should, ask yourself, if this is a preference, if it's a preferential issue, and it doesn't go my way, can I be happy? If it's a preference, no Bible verse attached, and it doesn't go my way, can I truly be happy? And if the answer is yes, then you have a submissive heart and praise God. That's what we're looking for. We, God wants every one of us, me included, to have submissive hearts to say, okay, even if it doesn't go my way, Lord, I'm all yours. Submission is not bad because submission is actually godlike. Do you remember Jesus in the garden? Not my will, but yours be done. <laughs> that was not a preferential issue. This was the humanity at stake. This was God's will. And he said, okay, Lord, if there's another way, I'll do it. But if not, not my will, but yours be done. And God said, this is my will. It's my will to crush my son. And he was crushed 
for your iniquity and my iniquity. We all need hearts that are submissive to God. And if we have a heart that's submissive to God, we'll be submissive to His Word, and then it'll be much more easy for us to obey our leaders. There is a few more things I want to give you before we leave tonight. Look back at verse 7 in the text. Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and consider the result of their conduct. Imitate their faith. (laughs) This has gripped me upon reading it. What this means is it's not just about what preachers preach. It's about their life. Imitate their faith, the outcome of their life. What this means is it's not good enough just to hear sermons. What this means is you need to see their lives and then submit yourself to the faith and the obedience that God wants for you that is pictured and mirrored in their life. Every pastor here has faults. Every one of us. I have faults. I'm going to rub you the wrong way. I'm going to ruffle your feathers. Pastor Heath will do so as well. The only one here who won't do that is John Sullivan. (laughs) We're thankful for him. (laughs) He sins, you just don't see it. (laughs) We all sin. But every pastor you have is qualified to be a pastor. And every pastor has something in their life that God wants you to see and to imitate. And a very practical application for the sermon is I want you to think about your pastors. Don't think about the negative things. Think about their way of life and the outcome of their faith. Their faith. It's not their own works. It's their faith in God who produces grace in their life. And then imitate that. Let me give you, if you need some examples, let me give you some. So it says, remember your leaders. That includes the past. So I never knew uh, Dr. Lindsay, but I know him through you. And one of the things that's on repeat that was a part of his life is gratitude and thankfulness. I've heard so many of you say how he taught to be thankful and he was thankful. That's remembering your leaders. Now imitate him. Be thankful. Follow his way of life. That's an application of submitting to his teaching. Pastor Heath, Dr. Sullivan once said to me that what Heath has experienced in the past five years, even just one of those things would have laid several pastors out of ministry. But God has given Heath incredible grace to be sustained and to serve selflessly. Two brain surgeries. (laughs) Brother, that's crazy. That's crazy. And yet you have incredible faith that is resilient and full full of God's grace as you trust in the sovereignty of the Lord in your life and full of God's care and goodness to you, knowing that whatever happens, God is in control. And brothers and sisters, you need to imitate that. Don't you want that in your life? I want that in my life. You you probably aren't going to face brain surgery. But you'll face something. You'll face suffering. And you need to imitate Pastor Heath and his life. Dr. Sullivan, Dr. Sullivan, if you don't mind me saying so, is an excellent speaker, an excellent pastor, an excellent preacher. I wish I had the gifting of oratory skills that you do. But I really believe that as, as gifted as he is, that the thing you need to learn from Dr. Sullivan is not only what he says, but how he has trusted in God's sustaining grace in the midst of grief 
in the loss of Miss Nancy. You have been an incredible example to us, brother, and it has been a true testimony to God's grace. There are, there are people... There are, there are people that when they lose their spouse, they're not all that sad because they didn't have a good marriage, and that is tragic. Not so with the Sullivans. There's deep loss. But in that deep loss, there is deep trust, and you need to imitate that. Follow in his footsteps. We could go on. I could pick each pastor, and we could go through, but I believe you get the point. It, Lastly, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. (laughs) This, This verse, I will confess when I read it here in the context, it felt a little random. We're talking, I mean, it's the concluding chapter of the Hebrews, and he's, he's exhorting them, and he's talking about leaders, and then he just slides this in right after, so he says, right after verse 7, remember those who lead you, who spoke the word of God to you, and consider the result of their conduct, imitate their faith, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I don't know exactly why he put that there, but let me give you a few reasons that I think could explain it. One is, leaders come and go. Pastors are mortal men whose breath leaves them. Your leaders will eventually pass away. You've been here long enough, some of you, that your leaders have gone. But Jesus Christ hasn't gone. (laughs) Jesus Christ is the same. He's here. Your faith should not be in a man. Your faith should be in the God-man, Jesus Christ. Don't trust a mere man. Trust in the Lord. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let me give you another reason. Men fail. Men are sinful. I was reading, even today, And someone said, a pastor is like a cardiologist with heart disease. A cardiologist who can help you, who knows how to fix your heart as best he can, but has heart disease himself. Pastors are fallen men, but Jesus Christ isn't. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and He is perfect. He always obeyed the Father. He always submitted to God. And lastly, I think this text includes this here, so that your faith is not found in anything temporary, but is found in eternal realities, and that eternal reality is God an eternal being. We don't seek a city here, the text says. We seek an everlasting city. But on that way to that city, God in His mysterious providence has given you leaders, pastors. And so I want to ask you tonight to believe with God, believe what He says, that submission is not a bad thing, but is a blessing. And that you would obey your leaders and to submit to them, not so that they would have groaning, but they would have joy, because if they groan, that is of no advantage to you. Let's pray and ask God for his help in responding. Heavenly Father, we need your help to submit to your lordship. And so I ask that you'd give us grace for that. I pray for our, I pray for our church. I pray that our hope and our faith would not be in men, but would be in the man, Jesus Christ. I pray that you would increase that faith tonight. I pray that you would help us to grow over these next few weeks as we look at this text again and again, and that you would make us more into your image. 
We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.